God, especially from the Islamic point of view, gives us a sense of intellectual liberalism. It's quite shocking I'm saying this, because I'm not a liberal. But what I mean by intellectual liberalism is that it widens our horizon because we don't attribute power to the material world. So therefore it doesn't become an obstacle to the realm of possibility of things that we could achieve in life. This is why we, it empowers us. And this is why we don't have a very weak-minded narrative like Michael's narrative of like making a caricature of the Quranic text. Look, it says cutting the hand of a thief. Look, it talks about apostasy. And the reason I'm saying this is because Michael again is falling for a fallacy because the Quran has never spoken about apostasy. The Quran not once speaks about apostasy and saying that it should be killed. So I don't know where you got that from. Uh, maybe someone emailed you. The second point is, is about beating wives. The Quran never talks about beating wives in the meaning and sense that you talk about. What mean? But the point is, we need to not make a caricature of our tradition. Because, for example, if we go to the Dutch Constitution, Article 97, the most liberal nation in Europe, it says you must force this on non-Dutch nationals. If I have Michael's mindset, I would conclude all Europeans force things on non-Europeans, evil people. But as a Muslim who believes in God, and God is not redundant for me, allows me to have this intellectual liberalism, if you like, to really look at things in a nuanced way, not to make a caricature and a cartoon of the Islamic worldview. And in answer to that, where is your reference point to even judge that these things are good or morally bad in the first place? You don't even have a reference point. Your reference point is social conditioning, which according to that, if we look at it studies in Belgium that there's an organization called NAMBLA, the North American Men Boys Lovers Association, that they are trying to use UN human rights legislation for Fantastic. old men to make love to three-year-old boys. And they, but according to social consensus, <laughs> his reference point for morality, that will be a good thing in a hundred years. Okay. Glad we'll be dead by then, right? Time's up, Michael. <laughs> okay. Okay, the reference point that I've given for morality. Social consensus. Okay, the reference point that I've personally given to morality, I'm sure at least five times, uh, is that a, the worst possible world is a world in which all sentient beings are suffering to the maximal extent for no reason. That's a, a formula that has currently been proposed by Sam Harris in his book, The Moral Landscape. If you want to read it uh, for a more nuanced explanation, I would recommend that, that you do so. Um, there are two ways to caricature any book uh, such as the Quran. One would, would be to say that everything in it is bad. And some people do make that argument, I don't. Another way of caricaturing it is to say that everything in it is good. That's equally a caricature. <coughs> I'm doing neither of those things. What I'm saying is that it includes some things that are morally good and some things that are morally bad. That's not a caricature. With regard to the sources, uh, the, the relevant verses, uh, 4.34 um, is the one that, that talks about men being allowed to beat their wives in certain circumstances. Uh, what does that mean? Two, 2.82. You don't even know says, what it means, though. Sorry, well, that's a caricature. You, you, know, you, you, you need to... No, but you can't, you you can't bewitch the audience with rhetoric. You can't. That's not fair. Because this has you, social you can't, implications. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't... No, but you have to be you fair. Have, you have the opportunity. No. Go on, Mike. Okay, I'm sure those of you who have copies of the Quran can look up the references and find out exactly what the wording is. 434 suggests that men can beat their wives under certain circumstances. 2, 282 suggests that women's testimony is worth half that of a man. 411 suggests that women can inherit half of what a man can inherit. 538 suggests that you should cut off the hands of thieves. 489 suggests that you should kill people who are disbelievers or who leave Islam. And 929 suggests that you should fight non-Muslims until they are in a state of subjection. Now, I understand that there is a, a lot, that there is a lot of counter-arguments on, on, on these sort of issues about uh, what certain Arabic words mean and uh, that, that the Arabic words can mean this, that, and the, and the other. But there is no doubt that these type of verses exist and that these type of, of, of verses condition people to believe that it is okay to, uh, to do things such as the, the recent example in, ba example in Bangladesh where a 14-year-old girl was uh, accused of having an affair with a married cousin and was beaten up first of all by the cousin and then as she lay in her bed trying to recover from that, there was a trial held by village elders including uh, the, the, the local Islamic cleric who decided that she should be lashed <coughs> as a punishment for that. She was beaten again on, as a result of that and died as a result of, of that beating. 
Now, that is the type of thing that will inevitably result when you have people being able to point to phrases like this and say, that is the word of the creator of the universe. And irrespective of whether those type of things are done under that type of jungle justice scenario, or if they are done after so-called uh, judicial processes and so-called trials, I still find them morally... Uh, I'll be strong enough to say I find them morally repugnant, not merely morally bad. I find them morally re repugnant, and I think that having books that assert to be written by the creator of the universe, or that are, it is asserted on their behalf that they're written by the creator of the universe, makes it more likely that these type of things are going to happen.